This is a soft rock ensemble. 7 megahertz, 10 megahertz and 14 megahertz. Uh, I will demonstrate how it performs in what I call QRP mode. That is running it with a fixed uh, frequency of the SI570 and then varying the INQ audio signal into it to cover uh, in this case plus minus 45 kilohertz roughly. As a first test I will look at the output here on this spectrum analyzer. This is what I see uh, in the full band coverage. It is about minus 30 dBm on 650 megahertz with a lot of emissions in the UHF range. Uh, I don't know what the rules say but I think this is harmless. There will be antennas and filters of various things so not much of this could radiate. It is set to 7.05 megahertz. Uh, the leakage from the local oscillator, the SI570, is about minus 38 dBm. So it's a fairly strong signal if you would listen at the same time with the normal radio on the same antenna. Now it's transmitting. The audio frequency is about 7 kilohertz. Uh, the strongest spur is here. It's at minus 16. That is uh, 46 decibels below the carrier. So it's a strong spur uh, with some margin, little margin within the rules in the United States. Uh, far too strong for radio amateurs to use, in my opinion. The audio comes from a Delta 44. I can reduce the level here. Uh, let's say down there. 81. It's not decibels, it's some arbitrary scale. And we can see the signal level here went down from 1 watt to uh, 25 dBm. That is 5 decibels less. 3 times less power, roughly. Uh, the spur. Now the strongest one is here. At minus 23. Uh, so this is, what can it be, 25 minus, minus 23, that's about 50 decibels. So it's a little better, but not drastically better as one would expect if this was a sign on clipping. It's the non-linearity of the op-amps, because they are heavily loaded by the mixer, which has a fairly low impedance. Better op-amps would probably eliminate these third overtone spurs or make them very small so they would be insignificant. To see what happens I have connected a straight key to this system and do some keying. And if I press the key and hold it down, you can see after a while the distortion goes down. But when I do normal keying, like this, the spur is stronger. It's too strong. I'm now transmitting dots with a duty of about 10% can see here and on the S meter graph here. On the spectrum analyzer it looks like this and uh, not so fun but there is a hold max hold function 
so it will build up the spectrum after a while. There was one exactly on the center while the pulse came. So now we have the spectrum marker. It is one watt and the spur is minus 40 dB below the carrier. It's 3 dB too strong. I don't know the reason for this. Maybe it's the heating of the op-amps. That seems to be from the time constant. Uh, I don't know. Here is the same uh, 1 watt 10% duty, but this is on the Perseus. Keying is excellent, as you can see. Uh, I click about 2 kilohertz away from the signal to move it 2 kilohertz. And you can see that uh, now the level is about 100 dB below the level on the signal. I go back, you can see it's at zero on the S meter. If I click on the spur, we have it here. You can see that the spur is 40 dB. Sounds like that. It's 40 dB below the carrier. So it's the same that I could see on the commercial spectrum analyzer. Uh, to solve this problem, it's possible to put the INQ signal at a very much lower frequency. But there are some complications associated with that, and I will show that in detail. Uh, this is what the signal looks like on the digital oscilloscope. It's set in a particular mode to show maximum and minimum, uh, not actually the waveform. If I run it faster, you can see that the rise time is something like uh, 3 milliseconds. On a conventional oscilloscope, it looks like this. And this is the audio, this is I. Uh, and on top of it is the control signal, the PTT, that switches the soft rock transmit side on and off. Now INQ is 200 Hz. Keying is no longer as good. If I move about 2 kHz here, you can see, firstly there is some signal. That's all the spurs that are now uh, spread around the main signal, but at the intervals of 200 Hz, uh, or multiples thereof. There is the mirror image 400 Hz away, and there is the third overtone uh, also 200 Hz away on the other side. So we are listening to the image. But we have keying clicks up to 70 dB, and I move a little bit further out, like that, and we have these keying clicks. They are not terribly strong, but they are there. And we can see them clearly on the main spectrum. The reason for those signals becomes obvious when I increase the gain here. There is something at the end here, but there is something also here coming and going. And the tail leads to uh, the time uh, here it cuts off and here we have some nasty things. The explanation to that can be seen here. If I increase the gain, uh, we have a DC component coming up and down here. And we have a DC component here as well. Uh, more visible maybe. 
No. Uh, if I increase the keying rate, like this, uh, so now I'm keying with 14 Hz square wave. Then you can see that the DC level jumps up and down a little bit, also at the point when switch on happens. So these are the keying clicks. And they come because the frequency is now low. It's just a small number of oscillations and together they contain a DC voltage. I can lower the frequency further. Like this. And then problems become more severe as you can see here. Uh, I want to be able to run much lower frequencies than this. I also want to be able to run single sideband uh, with the passband symmetric on both sides of the center. Uh, to do that properly one would need DC coupling, but to do it well enough uh, one just has to have much bigger capacitors. So I will rebuild and put in bigger capacitors. This is what it looks like on the Perseus. If you see the upper spectrum, you can see the key and clicks spread out by about over nearly 100 kilohertz. I will change the I and Q from this frequency to about one kilohertz. And there is a big change, as you can see. The signal doesn't have very much of those uh, spurious emissions that come from the DC due to uh, uh, two small capacitors. And here uh, you can see the things after and before uh, keying, they are much smaller. And here it's still with very high gain. We don't see the big DC voltages anymore. Because there are so many oscillations now, 1 kilohertz, that the average of them comes uh, very close to zero from a DC point of view. This is the Delta 44 uh, with its PCIe to PCI adapter. It's a modified board, uh, but only on the input. On the output there are the coupling capacitors here and here. They are 22 microfarads. I will put something bigger there. Now the capacitors are 470 microfarads and uh, I had uh, 10 volt capacitors and the op-amps are from 12 volts and the average output is likely to be around 6 volts, so this should be okay. If I bring up the gain here, it looks different from before, as you can see. The time constant is much longer, and the DC I get is much smaller. Uh, of course, with the rise time I have, it means uh, the rise time is faster than the period of the audio, so uh, ultimately if I go for a very low audio frequency, like this, uh, bring down the gain, it's obvious that the uh, DC voltage is different depending on how uh, this very low frequency it's about 40 Hertz now uh, that's too low to use of course uh, there are capacitors inside the soft rock also 
Here's the signal I have directly on the mixer. And with some more gain, you can see that the time constant is very short compared to what we have seen before. So I will modify also the soft rock. Now I put 470 microfarads instead of the 10 that were there before. Uh, this is 180 hertz and I increase the gain and you can see it looks rather different from before. Now uh, it's a DC voltage nearly, it's not much of an exponential in this time scale. Uh, looking at the RF, uh, this is now 2 volts peak to peak nearly and I bring up the gain and here you can see we have about 20 millivolts of uh, uh, the LO that comes from the unbalance caused by the DC. So this signal caused by the DC is 40 decibels uh, below the main signal at 2 volts but it is abruptly keyed here. That's because I'm running QSK uh, switching off the signal very soon after the uh, Morse code dot. But 40 decibels uh, reduction in the key and clicks means they are not very strong. That can be seen here with the Perseus. On the signal the level is zero. And if I go uh, 10 kilohertz away, the key and clicks are at about minus 75. And this is of course because I have such a low frequency uh, for the I and Q. On the other hand, all the spurs and the mirror image and LO leak through are in a very close range near the carrier. So we only have some spurs that are fairly far away. I don't know the origin, but they are not strong. The strongest one is at minus 80. And here is another one. And here is one that is minus 88 or so. Uh, I don't know the reason for them, but maybe they can be removed. We will see. I now turn down the signal level by 40 decibels. And then you can see very clearly the LO leak through at minus 56. Now I bring down the level to minus 90 decibels. And then you can see only the LO uh, leak through at minus 56. It's not a strong signal, but it's non-zero. This is the CW setup screen in Linrod. Uh, I have set it to rise time 5 milliseconds, carrier frequency 100 hertz, and both uh, tone keying and normal hand keying. This is what it looks like on the Perseus. And I press the key to have a continuous carrier. So with the tone 100 hertz, uh, we should expect uh, the signal and the mirror image to be separated by 200 hertz. And then the third harmonic is here. And then the fifth, 
7th, 9th, 11th, 13th, 15th. And it's symmetric, so we have also here the 15th harmonic. Uh, can look at the levels. Uh, I have to make the bandwidth narrower to resolve them. Uh, so the mirror is here. And uh, uh, I didn't center it properly. Here is the mirror, the third order spur, uh, five, fifth order, it's at minus 65. Uh, was it ninth, I think, here? But you can see, uh, to get really weak spurs, I have to go about one and a half kilohertz away uh, from the signal. And here I'm out in the noise floor, which is down at minus 110 at this particular bandwidth, which is fairly narrow. If I go for a normal bandwidth, let's say one kilohertz, we are at about minus 100. And then I don't resolve all these components. Uh, keying, we have keying clicks because the frequency is low. But the level, as you can see, is minus 80 dB for the peaks of the key and clicks. And this is a compromise. I could change the tone. And I change the carrier frequency, that's D, and I make it 500. Now the spectrum is five times wider which we can see here. Uh, the keying clicks are now smaller. If I go a little bit away from the center, 10 kilohertz away, like that, and we don't see them anymore. We see the spurs, but very small keying clicks. But, if I go on the signal and press the key, we can see the carrier. And here at the center, we have the leak through of the LO signal, sorry. I make the bandwidth a little bit weaker. Uh, there are, I guess, 50 hertz hum and things there. Uh, the mirror. Uh, the third order harmonic. Sorry, must have been something else. This one is the third order at minus 46 now and uh, it's better visible in the upper spectrum. There are several uh, spurs within a range of uh, maybe 15 kilohertz but outside that range uh, the key and clicks are very small This is 10 kilohertz away, and uh, key and clicks are uh, nearly uh, invisible. So this is about the, the compromise between uh, low 
uh, I and Q frequency and key and clicks. If we could have DC coupled systems, this wouldn't be a problem at all.